Welcome to the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast, where business leaders tell their stories and share their insights. All our guests have a personal connection with Nottingham Business School. So listen, learn, enjoy and share. So John Peace has enjoyed a hugely successful and distinguished leadership career. He was founder, chief exec and chairman of Experian. He went on to chair fellow FTSE 100 companies Burberry and Standard Chartered. He is now chairman of the Midlands Engine, which was set up by government ministers to increase local economic growth. And as Lord Lieutenant of Nottinghamshire, he is also the King's representative in the county. Sir John Peace, welcome to the Business Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Mike. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Good stuff. So, you were born in Mansfield, educated at Sandhurst. Early in your career, you had a a variety of corporate leadership roles before going on to be chairman of three FTSE 100 companies. It seems you've always been a leader. So, are leaders born rather than made? Oh, Mike, that's a very profound question. But what I will tell you about that journey that you just outlined there, how things have changed. And I can remember right at the start of that journey thinking... I better get on with doing this quickly because someone else will do it. And I think every step of the way, change has powered decisions that I've taken, career choices, actions that I've taken. You've got to be aware of the speed of change in the environment around you. And you know, today it's moving even more quickly. And that's why it's so important to have maybe not just one career, but multiple careers. And that's what, if you look at my bio or CV that you just described there, I always found there was a point where I knew instinctively time to do something different. I'm a restless spirit and moving on from time to time, I always felt was the right thing to do. Taking risks? Well, that's a good question, you know, Mike, because as a nation, as a country, we're very risk averse. Everything we do in life here is set out to minimize risk. Indeed, that's a good thing in many ways, health and safety and all of those things. But at the same time, in business, sometimes you've got to take risks. Especially when you're pioneering, you're doing things nobody's ever done before. If you're not a risk taker, you won't succeed. And you and I were joking a little while ago about Americans, people like Elon Musk, and I'm sure you'd say he was a leader, but he's a risk taker. And what he'll do, he'll have the confidence in his own ability with someone else's money, usually, (laughs) to take risks, just to get something done. So you you founded Experian. Was that a risk at the time? It's been a pleasure working on Experian over all the years. Yes, it was a a risk. Um, It it was a risk in that um, I'd been over to California to Space Park, I worked and got to know a company over there called TRW. You've probably never heard of TRW. (laughs) They did the Apollo 11 mission. They were the private sector firm that did that, and they put a lot of investment in developing databases and video screens that flickered and so on, and uh, and online systems. And that was a long time ago, Mike, so don't ask me the dates (laughs) for here. But what that did was to show me what the potential was of creating a business, we didn't call it Experian, we called it CCN, which basically replaced microfiche, printouts, processes which were very slow and cumbersome, and introduced new technology, new technology, new analytics, not just data, to actually de-risk many of the things that were happening, but more importantly, got things done more quickly and better. And were you always, right from the start, certainly would work? Absolutely not. What I did have, I guess, was the confidence to try things and not be afraid when it goes wrong. Uh, I think it was Jack Welsh at GE at the time who said, if I take 10 decisions a day, so long as I get seven right, that's okay. But if I take only five decisions a day and get them all right, that's not good. So it's a question of what your job is, what you're doing. But taking risks in life from time to time, calculated risks, not not being reckless, but I think it's something, and certainly people listening to this podcast, they will in their careers be faced with decisions that they have to take. 
If you're not prepared to take a risk, you will not maximise your opportunity. Okay, so if taking a calculated risk is one of the um, is one of the characteristics of, of a leader, of a good leader, what would others be? Well, it's only one characteristic, and and certainly there are different leaders um, come in different forms. You know, let, let's let's talk about, for example, Ukraine right now, and they have a leader, um, and that leader who's on television most nights now, he didn't start out life as a leader. He was in the entertainment business. I think he was a comedian on Ukrainian television. Yes, I understand he was. Before the war with Russia, do you think, or indeed he became prime minister, president of, of Ukraine, do you think people would have viewed him as a leader? And yet today on Forbes magazine, uh, all in America as well as over here in Europe, people are seeing him as one of the greatest war leaders since Churchill. Leadership comes in many different guises, many different shades of risk-taking. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, what he has are characteristics which are right for the moment that's making him so famous. For example, he's a good communicator. And that's so important today in this digital world, social media, he knows how to communicate. And when you watch him on television, or when he's being interviewed, Watch how good he is that you think he's talking to you. And that's a real quality. And is that something that he's picked up along the way, or is it something that is innate? Well, I'm sure some of it is, is uh, in, innate, but you can improve things. You know, this mm. is your world here. You can improve people's ability to communicate. You can go on courses. Mm. NTU runs courses on that very topic. But I do think it's about, first of all, um, having certain basic instincts and confidence, you have to have some confidence to be able to either stand up in front of an audience, give a talk after a dinner party or where have you, or, or, or sometimes just go on social media, sit on the side of a desk and tell people what's on your mind. Okay. You, don't have to, you don't have to write speeches, just talk to people who are going to listen to you and be relevant in what you say. And he's masterful at it. Is that something that you were aware of five decades ago when you started your leadership career? I had the great privilege of working with some great leaders over the years. And, and I certainly, I think today, I'm a better leader because I'm a good listener and a good learner. Learning, particularly at university, picking things up from others is very important and learning from that. But for example, um, let me just talk about women for a moment. I've worked with some of the most powerful, successful women chief executives in the world. One lady, I brought her in from the United States. She's an American, Angela Ahrens. And I brought her in from a very small retail business um, in the United States. When I just le lost, she went back home, another American chief executive, Rosemary Bravo, another woman, and Rosemary, was one of the best viewed by investors in the market as one of the best chief executives in the world. And they were expecting me to have brought in a new big hitter, someone who I had to pay millions of dollars to, to attract them. I didn't. I brought in Angela Ahrens from Idaho. And for the first two years, it was difficult. And she wouldn't talk to the media, and she didn't want to talk to investors, but she had something, she had qualities and in the end, she's become world famous for her ability to build a luxury brand like a Burberry. She left me, and I remember that. that at Burberry? You were, you were with her at Burberry? Uh, she was my chief executive. I brought her in as, as the chief exec of Burberry. But then she left Burberry because she'd been over here for about seven, eight years. Her children, by the way, stayed. They wanted to stay here. They love Britain. They love the universities here. But she went back because um, Tim Cook of Apple paid her rather a large sum of money to go back and become his number two in Apple. I couldn't match that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and what, what, what stood out about her as a leader when you first saw her? And what did you identify that everybody else missed? Well, she's very, uh, she was clearly very bright, but more importantly, her ability to get things done. Her ability to face a challenge, not on the basis this is going to be too difficult, but on the basis of what do I have to do to succeed? 
And as she gained in more confidence, and I was able to give her more confidence, I think, in because we became very close friends, very good uh, at working together as a team. Teamwork's important in leadership, as you know. But what she was able to do then was improve her communication techniques from not wanting to talk to anyone <laughs> at one stage to become one of the most brilliant social media connectors. And her following today is, is literally millions around the world. And, and that's interesting because you identified that communication, the communication skills as being incredibly important. But here's somebody who, who didn't have them but has effectively learned, learned them during the rest of her career. She developed them. Yeah. And, and sometimes she had them but she didn't know she got them <laughs> because that's back to risk and confidence and, and, and being prepared to do things which is out of your comfort zone. People listening to right. this often will say to you, oh, well, I don't like doing that. Well, fine, that's okay. But then don't expect for people to judge you as a great leader if you're not prepared to stand up there and sometimes take risks to actually tell them what you're wanting to do. Leadership is about persuading others to do what you think is right. Right, okay. Now, your leadership in public, I've seen it in action, it always appears particularly calm and unflappable. But when I've spoken to your colleagues, they say, oh, he's <laughs> driven, he's driven. Um, one of them said to me that he thought you'd love to solve all the world's problems. Um, so. Not uh, at the same time, <laughs> right? come on, well, uh, well, give well, me what, a break. <laughs> what I wanted to ask was, are, are, are all the most successful leaders driven to achieve? I don't know about all of them, but I think, I think a very high proportion are driven. Right. They care about what they're doing. And, you know, the other thing, and um, the, the president of Ukraine I'd put in this category, they've all got a good moral compass. Right. They're driven to succeed because, you know, it doesn't matter to them how big their bonus is or what, what accolades they're going to achieve. They know it's important for others. And that's why I went on, having been very successful in my public company careers, many of them, I wanted to do public service. I wanted to do things here in the Midlands, and that's why I did the Midlands engine. That's why I took here in Nottinghamshire the role of Lord Lieutenant, because it gave me an opportunity to help others. Yes, I mean... Uh, as I've already mentioned, you're currently Lord Lieutenant of, of Nottingham, Chair of the Midlands Engine, as you just pointed out. Um, both very time-consuming roles. I mean, you mm. obviously love your leadership. Um, you know, do you have to enjoy the responsibility of being in charge to be to, to be a leader? Oh, Mike, you, you've been talking to my wife again. I can <laughs> see that. She's been telling you he's never here. He's always busy and. Uh, isn't there an expression, an old-fashioned saying, that um, if you want something doing, find a busy man or a woman to do it? Yeah. And whatever I do in my life, for the rest of my life, I'll be busy. Yeah. But I, do, I hope what I've become better at over the years is more purposeful in what I do, more selective in how I can use the time that I have available to get things done. And I, and I certainly haven't left the private sector. I continue to find innovation and enterprise, something this country and this county is particularly brilliant at, and I want to continue to keep striking that balance. Um, there, there, there's something that you just, you just said in there that just made me think. Um, you've been a high-profile leader for several years. You lead from the front, and yet I am terrible. I've been reading all about you. And I saw this fantastic quote. Which said, it was a word I had to go and look up because I didn't, I didn't recognise it. It said you were unclubbable. <laughs> I thought, is that, I mean, it doesn't like being hit around the head with something. <laughs> but no, it, it, it actually means someone who has little sense of their own importance. You know, how do leaders keep their feet on the ground? You talk about a moral compass there. I guess it follows on with that. Yeah, you know, sadly, last, last year we lost a great lady, Her Majesty the Queen. And she always had this expression, it's not about me, it's about others. And I guess... That's why, as Lord Lieutenant, I found her someone who I aspired to be like, to serve others. It isn't about what you just want to think or do. Now, I am tough in situ situations, and if I think I've got a good idea, I'll fight my corner. But I'll listen. I'll listen to what other people think. And if they've got better ideas than me, I have no problems at all in adopting those ideas. But bringing people along with you is so important. All too often our politicians forget that. They think because they're in power, this is what you should do, and, it, and it's seen as an order. I've never viewed management like that. And I used to pick up folks 
frequently in Experian or in the bank or at Burberry and say to them, look, when they say uh, to me, um, well, um, what do you want us to do? And I'd say to them, no, it, it's not, don't say it like that. It's what we're going to do for each other. We, we are a team. We're working together. I don't just want to give you instructions. I don't just, you know, the badge you wear is irrelevant. If people respect you, if people think what you're going to propose to do is the right solution, so you're going to be a communicator, you've got to, you've got to listen to what their ideas are as well as speak your own, if you can then triangulate that, if you can then strike the right balance there, that's leadership and you'll carry people with you because they'll know what you did, not just what you thought, but it's what we together thought. It's not about me, it's about us together. There's a certain amount of selflessness in there, isn't there? Well, the Queen was wonderful at that. And yes, there is. And, and a lot of my friends, I think, are in that category. So maybe it's birds of a feather flocking together here. But we need that today, don't we? We've, we've got uh, a very tough situation globally that we're dealing with, wars in Ukraine or, and, and the inflation issues and so on. And... Uh, I think it's so important now that we do adopt this attitude of we, how can we help you? How can we serve you rather than simply, well, I'm all right, Jack, and, and as long as I'm doing well, I don't care about you. I, that, that's not who I am. I would like people to remember me for what I did for others, not for what I did for myself. That's interesting because in a, another one of your previous roles has been uh, as chairman of the Work Foundation um, a respected think tank and, and one of their uh, duties as I understand it is to, to try and map out a, a future for leadership mm. so do you think that's part of it post pandemic Britain 2023 mm. how is leadership developing where are we going mm. well, I do love think tanks I, I do like thinking things through and what you touched on earlier you backed off but you were right if I could help solve all the problems of the world I would have a go at it I I'm a mathematician that's what I am more than anything, and I love solving problems. And so, therefore, um, I love to be able to get involved with people and organizations that are tackling those problems. And the Work Foundation is a brilliant think tank, and it would come up with some very uh, innovative ideas on the way work should be shaped and work uh, in going forward into the future. Now, actually, on that board that I chaired for that, because I chaired it, um, I had some very clever clever people on that board, including members of the trade union as well as business leaders. And if you can get people from all different partners, all members of the same partnership group trying to achieve the same thing, if you can get them all them working together, you get some really good output. You can really good results come from that. Okay, so the, the question that certainly in, 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 in my world people talk about a lot, this idea of how much... Um, uh, how much work should be done online as opposed mm. to face to face and i guess this is a management rather than a leadership issue mm. but where do you think that's going what do you what in in terms of in terms of leadership mm. does not being face to face more often make life more difficult mm. I, I don't think we're going to go back to where we were where everything's about face to face mm. and i think the new technology is an, in an advancement is moving forward goodness me uh, I think I saw, I think 1921 or 22, someone pointed out the minutes of a, a, a general, uh, of the, what do they call it, the general post office uh, board meeting. And the chairman was very upset because the, some, some director was putting forward this notion they should focus more of the investment on telephones rather than telegrams. And he had to point out to the board, we are a telegram company. I hope I'm not like that. And, and certainly, I think it's important we recognise the speed of innovation and change that's taking place. However, however, <laughs> I can't help. Yes, exactly. I, I as, as everybody, I sit and listen to people <laughs> say this kind of thing every day. Yeah. And then and then once the microphone's off, they go, well, you know, and you say, but there is something about face-to-face -face contact. There is something it's, about... It's amazing. It's very important face-to-face -face contact because uh, I find it more with young people. You know, you take something like um, Canary Wharf, for example where you've got banks, law firms, and, and everything. It's the younger partners, members of those organizations that want to come back to meet in the bars in the evening, to socialize together, to find partners. You know, there's many reasons for doing it. One of the great things of university life is socializing together. 
All I'm saying to you, Mike, is I don't think you're going to get rid of the meetings either through Teams and Zoom and everything. It's a balance that has to be struck, but a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and human contact I think is essential. Okay. So it's, it, it, at least part of it is, is, is essential. Okay. Um, I just want to touch, drag you back to something else you were you were you were uh, talking about earlier. Your um, your love, your passion for Nottinghamshire. Yeah, I mean you've lived here all. It's your a great life. county. It is. It's a great Westfield. county. You've lived here, family all your life. Forest fan, uh, supporter of Nottinghamshire. Great team now. Come on, yeah, <laughs> let's get that in. They weren't so good. They weren't so good last night, were they? I thought that was a calculated decision by the manager so that they can focus on the league. Well, indeed, Goodness yes, me, uh, don't you know I anything mean, yeah. about football? <laughs> indeed, right, okay. So uh, also a supporter of Nottinghamshire, Nottinghamshire cricket, which is obviously a lot more successful at the moment. Uh, your high steward of Southwell Minster, Chancellor of Nottingham Trent University, Governor of local schools, trustee of local charities. Um, you know, you're very much part of this community. And I, 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 I extrapolate there and say, is it important for leaders at whatever level mm. to establish a supportive hinterland? I, I think it's important we all help out where we can. And particularly with um, organisations that require sometimes the, the expertise, the knowledge that you have, without getting paid, you, you simply provide that to them. And if it helps them, then that's a good thing. But it's a two-way it's a two-way equation as well. Having their support, mm. you know, I, I, <laughs> I do, do many things outside mm. of my work and feel that my work benefits for it because... Yeah, but you don't... You're, you're not, you're not, come on now, you're not doing <laughs> that because you think it's going to benefit your work. Or, you're no. doing it because you care about the organisation. Yes. You yes. think it's worthwhile, and that's why members of the royal family, for example, are patrons of various charities or organizations because they need their support sometimes to highlight to get get attention to the causes that they're championing sure but i'm guessing it helps their leadership too it's it's a two-way street it, it keeps you grounded it gives you the moral compass that you were just talking about earlier which comes first the chicken or the, the egg <laughs> here I, you know I, you're right you're absolutely right all of those organizations play a, a very important role within Nottinghamshire and, and, and sometimes even wider than that. And I think it's good for you as well as good for them to get involved with those organisations. Anyone listening to this podcast, I would hope that some of their life, either now or in the future, is, is donated, as it were, some of their time to helping those worthy causes. Okay. So, so what makes this country tick, you know? Oh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, now... At the end, this, as you know, this is a, a leadership podcast for the Nottingham Business School. And so at the end, I always ask this question, and I'm always fascinated by the replies. Mm -hmm. But what advice would you give to the budding young leaders current, currently studying at NBS? Well, the first thing I'd say to them, you've made a wise decision <laughs> yes. by studying at NBS. That's the first thing. As the, as the Chancellor of, <laughs> of Nottingham Trent University. Look, don't, don't distract what I'm saying here. Of course yes. that's a factor, but it's not really. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic business school. Sure. And use the time and the opportunity to meet with others mm -hmm. in person, if possible, listen to people, and from that will come opportunities for them to develop their skills as future leaders. Some of those people listening to this podcast, attending NBS, are going to be the leaders of the future. So we have a duty, and include you, Mike, here, mm. to help prepare them, help pave the way, as it were, for them to develop some of those key skills. And what can they do? What can they do themselves to prepare themselves? Well, they have to go that extra mile. This isn't just about what people can bring to them. It's what they can do to go out there and work with organisations, other uh, organisations that perhaps need the support of those students or of those people, either in the terms of their time or in terms of their knowledge that they, they have. So if you just sit on your backside and wait for things to come to you, all you're going to end up at the end of the day is with a sore bum and not necessarily something which is going to enhance your future life prospects. Excellent. Sound advice, Sir John Peace. Thank you very much for joining us on Nottingham Business Skills Business Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure.
If you enjoyed this episode, then why not check out some of the others that are also available? There's our special episode looking at female business leaders. And if insights from women entrepreneurs are what you're looking for, then there are also episodes with Judy Narka, the lady behind San Tropez, and Lucy Hagues, the CEO of Capital One in the UK. The Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast is produced for Nottingham Trent University by Celtic Tiger Productions. Your presenter was Mike Sassy, and your producer was John Collins.